uh, we, I'm going to be talking to you all tonight about growing crops in the cold. It's the furthest thing from many people's minds to be going out in the garden and harvesting things uh, today, or especially after that cold snap that we had over the last, uh, you know, last week and around Christmas time. Um, <clears throat> so. I'll be talking a little bit about how, uh, how how to do it, how I harvested kale yesterday from my garden, and uh, and but before too long, before I go any further, I'll introduce myself. I'm Dan Phileas. I am with Extension and Outreach with Iowa State uh, University, field specialist for commercial vegetables and especially crops um, in the horticulture department, and I serve all 99 counties. So if you are a commercial vegetable grower, I make house calls i help help, help folks uh, like you out and i also before this was a farm manager i managed a large organic vegetable farm in minnesota called featherstone farm just about an hour north of decorah and before that i managed the michigan state student organic farm at michigan state university which uh, a lot of this knowledge that i um that i have about winter growing comes from that because we that was a big part of what we did there uh, we did have fields for traditional in-season growing. Um, and we also had high tunnels that we harvested vegetables year round for sale. Out of 48 weeks out of the year, we would be harvesting fresh vegetables um, from the, the tunnels and fields. Um, obviously in the winter, it was all tunnels. Uh, but we grew a little bit of everything there. And tonight I'll be talking not about a little bit of everything, but specifically the vegetables that are grown in the cool seasons. And I'm, you know, that I'm, I'm defining that as the crops that succeed best from mid-September through mid-May in that growing season there, quote unquote growing season, right? Um, and the successful crops in general for that are uh, greens, alliums and root crops uh, do pretty well. The, the, the roots uh, are storage structures to help these plants make it through the winter. And so they, if you can keep them protected from the worst of the weather, they can do quite well. Um, and uh, in addition to leafy greens, herbs are often, um, often do quite well in the cool season as well. Um, and if I miss anything in this whole thing, in this uh, presentation. I'm so curious if you're already doing this and you're growing something that I don't talk about here. I'm so curious to hear what it is that I missed. So one of the things that I like the best about harvesting vegetables out of my garden at this time of year is that plants will get sweeter as they encounter temperatures that are below freezing. They will concentrate sugars in their cells as a natural antifreeze, it's grossly over, oversimplifying it, but it's 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 the easiest way to, that I've found to explain it. Um, but it just makes the harvest in the winter taste better. Additionally, they some plants look better. I think these. This is a picture of some bulls blood beet greens that have experienced several frosts, and you can see that deep maroon color. I think that they look just fabulous, and the flavor once you pair the cold sweetness with the beautiful color. I just think that it's it's hard to beat that. So how do you do this? I'm going to talk a lot in, in depth about this, but in general, here are the steps. Once it starts to get cool, row cover. And that's that, if you're not familiar with that term, that's this uh, this white sheet that is, uh, that is covering the, the plants in this picture. I'm going to try to, let's see, highlight it right here, this white sheet, this row cover, frost fabric, insect barrier, uh, it goes by a lot of different names. Rime is a common trade name. Agrabon is another one. So that's when it first starts, you know, a few degrees below freezing, uh, th that'll protect these plants, just laying right on top. Um, step two, if it's a little bit colder, you can do more row cover or a thicker type of it. The Once it gets too cold, the contact with the frost fabric on the leaves can damage the leaves. So putting hoops up to suspend and make a little tunnel over the crop, that's the next step. And to put cover again with row cover or plastic. And beyond that, then you're getting into real, honest to goodness, winter overwintering with a high tunnel. And beyond that, you can set up that hoop structure with covers inside the high tunnel, pairing steps three and four. And um, for folks who really want to be uh, harvesting the tenderest crops at the coldest times, 
uh, people are heating, adding a, a supplemental heater for extreme cold. Um, but for most gardeners, steps one through three are uh, are what they're they're going to be. You know what makes sense. I am in. I live in Des Moines. I have a double lot, so I have a large garden, but it's not really big enough for a high tunnel. So I am doing low tunnels. So I've got this experience from Michigan State with growing in high tunnels. I like eating these crops. So in my garden in Des Moines, I wanted to see what could I do with a very low budget, small scale thing. So I'm this. the next several slides here are uh, things that from my experience here in Des Moines from the last several winters um, growing in my garden here. And this is a picture of, of the low tunnels that I'm using. I'll tell you how to build them and what I'm growing. Um, but I like having homegrown salad all winter long. And really the, the hardiest thing, the thing that needs the least protection is spinach. Cilantro, I've been pleased to find is, is next in line there. And then lettuces and, uh, and single cut salad heads, also marketed as like Salanova, if you're familiar you know, from like the Johnny's catalog. Um, those things can survive too, but they are more damaged by like a period of long cold, like we, the one we just had. So I'm using tunnels that are made. You can use the uh, PVC hoops. I'm using metal conduit, electrical conduit that is sold in 10 foot lengths. And um, I place it over rebar that's been driven into the ground. And to bend that conduit, you can buy this thing that's uh, from Johnny's here. That's a pre-made jig that is from the Johnny's website. But you can make your own. And that's what I did. I just had some leftover wood and I found the the, the the radius of the circle that I wanted and I took a string and I drew that over and I took a jigsaw and, and, and cut that and bent the conduit around it. That stuff's really, really flexible. It doesn't take much oomph to get it to, uh, to be uh, bent in the shape that you want. So I bent those hoops into a semicircle more or less. And then I take rebar, drive it into the ground, leave about, oh, eight inches out of the ground. And then I just thread that that conduit over the top of it so that it's um, it's held straight up and down. Now, crops need to be, um, one, one, one side note here I'm going to say is you can't just uh, plant crops any time of the year. They need to be full-sized pretty much by the beginning of September uh, because we're not growing crops through the winter. We're basically holding them and they hold fairly well in these structures better than if you were to harvest them in November and keep them in your fridge. Then you'd only got a couple of weeks, but you're holding them at full size because growth doesn't really happen between mid-November and early February. Uh, the day length is too short. And so this is a chart from, a, from the Winter Harvest Handbook. And it just shows you um, if you were to plant this crop on say on 8-8 eight, eight at the top here, then it would be harvested in mid-September. But if you were to plant it on October 3rd here, you wouldn't harvest it until December 8th. And then getting later and later, you see you just, there, there's less and less gain. So if you plant it too late, you end up not having a harvest until the spring or it's just too small and it, and it frosts out. Side note, back to how to make these tunnels. Um, I use greenhouse plastic that I, uh, have, that I purchased from a, a vegetable a produce supply company here in Iowa called Nolts, um, but you can get it from several other places. Um, and Nolts is up by Charles City. And I secure it with ropes and clips which I'll show in a sec, but I source those from Farmer's Friend. They, they make caterpillar tunnels and high tunnels. I like use them. So here's uh, the rope clips, like in the bottom left corner here. They get slipped over the rebar all the way down to the bottom. And then the conduit goes over the top here. And I added washers because you can see down here that the hole is a little big and the the conduits slipped through and went into the soil and, and ended up getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, and I added washers so it wouldn't do that. So I'd have a taller tunnel. And I used to secure it with ropes in a zigzag pattern over the top here, but I found that I get a better, tighter structure if I just have it uh, a loop over each hoop, 
a uh, little, you know, out over one side and, and, and back over the other and just cinch it down. Right? And that, that gives me a tight, th uh, tight fit. It holds up better in the wind. Each end is gathered and secured to a rebar stake that's at each end. And to prevent the hoops from falling over, there is a pipe or a, a strap that connects these pipes and keeps them upright and then is connected to that rebar stake at the end that the plastic is cinched down to. Along the edges, I put sandbags and with the ropes and the sandbags, I've had no problem keeping this upright and covered through, um, we had that December derecho last year. We had 70, 80 mile an hour winds for, for several hours uh, through the night that night. And I was, I certainly was up and awake checking out the window uh, pretty much every time I heard them make a noise, but they stayed covered the entire night with sandbags and ropes like this. Um, I was, I was, I was very pleased. Um, surprised even, but they they were able to do it. And I'll, I guess one asterisk next to that is that I am in an urban area. I'm not out at the edge of a field. If I think that potentially out in the edge of a field where it's much more open, there might be you might need to secure it more, or you'd have less success with these with this setup. But if you are in an urban area uh, or a place that's slightly protected, this it seems to be an adequate way to hold them up. Pull them together, excuse me. Um, the I, I'm lucky that most of the time in the winter and during the summer, I don't have shade on my garden. And winter sun is the key to success in these things. The sun heats up the green the, the greenhouses and warms those plants up inside um, so that they are not experiencing the deep cold all the time. So more shade equals less success. Um, if you do have warm temperatures, um, like in the fall and the spring, when these are first set up or, or coming about to be taken down, it's important to vent them so they don't overheat. But generally speaking, at this time of year, even if there's temperatures like today where it was in the 40s, um, it's not necessary to open these up. They're not going to be overheating. Even if it was sunny, it wouldn't get to be more than 55 or 60 degrees inside. Though if you are around and able to open them up, um, venting them removes humidity from the air, which can be better for uh, disease management. So here's some pictures from post-winter. Uh, spring 2021, we had a uh, the, tw the winter between 2020 and 2021 was pretty mild here, and I had great success overwintering these salad heads. You'll see them, they're small here, because that's, I, I, I'd eaten them, and but I'd harvested them once or twice through the winter. And then in the spring here, in February, they will regrow, and I got two or three more cuts. Um, so that's the single cut salads. Um, in this other bed, I had spinach here that survived the best. The baby leaf salads survived okay. And the baby leaf brassicas like pak choy, baby kale, those survived the worst, which I was surprised about because those were a real winner in the high tunnel. All right, last winter, 2021 to 2022, much colder. And so I had, you can see here, middle of January, I harvested cilantro over here on the left. I've got single cut salad heads looking pretty decent. Some, some spinach over on the right looking pretty decent. Uh, th these are the varieties in case you're curious, want to replicate this. This is green oak leaf, um, Salanova, and Frizzy Go is another one that I've found to be very good at tolerating the cold. Uh, but these other ones, red butterhead, green butter, red oak leaf, they did not tolerate the cold as much. They had pretty much turned to mush by mid-January last year. And I did take pictures today so you could see what it looks like today after that cold snap la uh, last week, week before. Um, but yeah, here's more more ugliness, just things that did not take the, we can just scoot past that. And then at the end of winter, spinach was the only thing that was 100% looked great. The single cut lettuce did not survive last winter. Um, cilantro was good, uh, but it needed, to, I just needed to clean it up, cut it back, 
clean out the dead stuff, but I was able to get a couple more harvests off that cilantro after that cleanup. And then here's a picture of spinach um, in March. I honestly, I got spinach last winter until uh, I think it was early May, because once things warm up, I remove that tunnel off of the thing, off the, the bed, and it's back to being in, in, in a ideal conditions. Um, if it was stayed in that tunnel, if I left it there, it would get too hot and the spinach would bolt. These varieties did not do well after last uh, cold winter, all these baby leaves. But if you look at the end of the tunnel, I've got some carrots back there and they did, they did decent. Napoli was that variety. So yeah, I mentioned it. What about today? We had super frigid weather around Christmas. I looked at the records, the temperature here stayed below freezing from the night of December 19th to the afternoon of December 27th. Eight nights with lows and single digits or lower, five of those where the lows were below zero Fahrenheit. One day where the high here was zero degrees Fahrenheit. You may be laughing because where you were was worse, but it was bad for a vegetable to be in a garden. But what's it look like? Here's the kale that I went out there and harvested yesterday. Not super, but pretty surprisingly good. Uh, I would say that this, this plant right here is looking halfway decent. Um, the growing tips you can see look damaged, so I don't know how these things are going to hold up. They they definitely took hits when it got super cold in high tunnels too. These this is one of the worst. The uh, this I let these crops because it had been pretty warm this fall. These crops were growing very big, and little baby things survive better than bigger leaves. So these ones didn't survive. Uh, I think they're alive, but they will take a lot of cleanup to to get something harvestable out of there. My uh, spinach, as I said, most reliable. Corvair is a good variety. Oroch is one I'm trying out this year that's more upright. It's doing pretty well. Baby leaf salads. Dill, not looking so hot. I might be able to get something off there, but no, I, I don't think so. Cilantro, again, going to take some cleanup, but I think I'll be able to harvest from right out over here and get a, and get a crop uh, to use. Parsley. Here's those single cut salad heads. Frizzy Go is doing well still. These other ones, not so hot. I'm still, I like that Frizzy Go. But I should, I guess I should say that in the high tunnels, we, we would not count on getting uh, lettuce heads after Christmas. And so it is pushing it to expect to get these things beyond Christmas. So if you were planning to do this, I would recommend just plant enough for you to get you through Christmas. And is it really, I, I think it's kind of exciting to it, getting salad from your garden through Christmas is already in a, a, a feat. It's not something that I should be ashamed of, that it doesn't get any further than that. Uh, excuse me. Here's the carrots from today. You can see uh, uh, a close up of the actual root in the, in the ground. And the, the thing that I, that doesn't do great about these carrots is at the end of the winter, the top inch or so of, of the shoulders here, the texture is not great, but the all the bit below that is the sweetest candy carrot you've ever tried. It's so good. So some general nuts and bolts. You harvest the radishes, salad turnips, lettuce heads, big chard before Christmas, before they get really cold. Baby leaves, like I said, are hardier than large leaves. So if you've got stuff that gets too big, harvest it uh, earlier. Give some to your neighbors, maybe. Um, if you're planting brassica heads, um, totsoy is one that bolts the first in January. Kale is one of the things that bolts last, uh, then chard after that. If you have Napa cabbage or large bok choy, get those before a deep freeze like last week, because once they freeze solid, they don't it takes a lot to thaw them out and they, and they go downhill very fast. Um, this, uh, <laughs> this is if you're, if you're selling this stuff, all fresh produce in the winter has a wow factor, but there's only so much kale a person wants to eat. And it's important to know, this is maybe the most important thing uh, for harvesting in the winter, is that you must harvest after things thaw out in the late morning. If you harvest things when they are frozen, they will just, when they thaw out, be mush. But if they thaw out still attached to the plants, then they will be okay. And if you have a big enough structure, supplemental heat can help. 
that happened earlier in the day. Um, this is a high tunnel, but it's important to remember this for the low tunnels too, that if there's a big snow event, and I'm talking, you know, this was in Michigan, we had much better chance of having a big snow event. Um, it was important to clear any accumulated snow so that the house doesn't collapse under the weight. And a low tunnel is much less sturdily built than a high tunnel. So get that sweeped off. And, and then if there's too much along the edges, it can't shed off. So you might have to snow blow or dig that away. Additionally, snow on top prevents the sun from getting in and warming the crop. So I'm gonna um, show a few uh, slides here uh, after we've, now we've talked about the low tunnels. I wanna talk about the high tunnels. Maybe some of you have one of these um, and, and maybe this will be applicable, but if not, at least it'll show us, uh, show you a little bit more uh, context about what can be done. So high tunnel production in the seriously cool season, the deep winter. Um, like I mentioned, we uh, were harvesting every week pretty much of the year. And we promised our CSA members, our customers, that we would provide for them three fresh greens each week of the winter with 10 total items in the share each week. So three out of 10 were fresh greens harvested that week. And yes, we did have diverse warm season crops in the summer in those tunnels. We could grow tomatoes, eggplant, ginger is what's in this picture. And like I said, spinach is hardiest. Large leaf, even though I mentioned that little leaves survive the winter best, on spinach, I have found that I get the best results when I plant them, individual plants, further apart. Uh, it's, a, it's just a tougher plant. It can, it can tolerate that. The baby leaves tend to have uneven stands and they crowd each other out. Um, and with big leaves, the stems, like a lot of people cut the stems off and throw them away. The stem is the sweetest part. And um, I, 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 I dream of someday there being more of, a, more of a supply at the supermarket of local sweet winter spinach. I, I would love to be able to, to, to see that in the supermarket for Iowans to be able to sell that to the, to the grocery stores rather than in the winter them relying on greens from California. Um, I mentioned tatsoi is uh, one that, that bolts early, um, so it needs to be harvested earlier. Komatsuna is another one that's a different green, um, and they both tend to get tip burn on the leaves. One crop that is that I've only seen in high tunnels is what we called kale rob, which is basically the flower stalk of the kale plant, and it is... Oh my gosh, it's like broccoli, but 10 times sweeter and flavorful and delicious. And, and uh, you know, maybe the, the, if you don't like kale, at least kale rob is like, is, is amazing. I think you would, you would love it. It's like a little broccolini, um, but each plant will produce one flower stalk. We'd snap them off and bunch them and, and sell those. So that was our last crop off of those, um, off of those. Uh, here, this is a picture of a house in late April. We had ripped out our winter uh, or our harvested winter heads and replanted with head lettuce. And you can see we've already got head lettuce uh, ready for market. And our second succession of radishes in the foreground there will be ready soon. You will often see in seed catalogs, let's say you want to do this. You're all sold. You want to do this and you are going to go buy varieties. You're going to go buy seeds for this. Heads up, if you're buying a salad mix, the pre-mixed salad mixes, usually the varieties mature at different rates. And so that leads to, you know, you get some small leaves and some giant leaves. And when you cut it, it, it just isn't as fun of an eating experience because you get big leaves. So I, what we did was we would plant, buy the varieties separately and then plant them in individual rows or bands so that we could harvest those bands separately and mix them together so they're all harvested at the exact right size. Here's a picture of the uh, zoomed out of the house planted that way and one bed planted that way. We um, tried planting some beds both directions so they would be much, uh, so we'd get more, we thought, crop out of the bed, but ended up being, it never grew more than, you know, an inch tall. So I would not recommend that. That can't, things can be too tight. 
too thick. Um, the seeding needs to be thick enough so the plants are shoulder to shoulder, but not stem to stem. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, instead of broadcasting the seed over the, uh, it works to broadcast the seed, but I found, we found that seeding them in discrete rows made for heart, made an easier harvest because you could follow that row, chop, chop, follow, chop, chop. Rather, and if it's all mixed together, it's harder to get your hand around it um, nicely. Um, I'm gonna skip past that one to uh, talk about shade cloth. You In the summer, so this is how to use that tunnel structure to grow greens at a differently unsuitable time of the year when it's blazing hot in the summer. We turned one of our high tunnels into a summer greens house, and the same thing can be done with low tunnels. If you put shade cloth over the top of that tunnel and regularly overhead water it to, to, to cool it down, then you can get greens, really great greens, grown better in that structure than you can unprotected in the summer. So, and in this picture, you can see hanging from the 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 supports there are um, we, we, were, we were doing an experiment with some oyster mushrooms um, that, that were in bags because we had the shade there. We thought that would help out um, the growth of those oyster mushrooms. I it worked, but it wasn't terribly better. It was it was interesting, but uh, we watered inside this house with the sprinkler. So the mantra we have for winter harvest is grow the right crop, plant it at the right time, one with multiple harvests and properly protect that thing. So what is the right crop? I've talked about several of them already. If you're curious about varieties, here's a big long list of them that I'll, I'm not gonna read all of these, but these are, one, these are varieties of each of these crops that grew really well for us. And because not every variety is suited for winter growing, just like not every variety is suited for summer growing. Each one is specific for something. Uh, spinach is kind of a, 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 a funny one because the varieties that are in catalogs are driven by the big spinach industry out in California. So you might find a good spinach variety that you love, but it, if it doesn't meet the needs of the California spinach industry, it could be gone the next year. And so that was the, I found my favorite was called raccoon. And it was, um, it was fabulous. It was super upright. It was a beautiful leaf, but it was only around for two or three years and, and then it, it's gone. Um, so Oroch is the one I'm trying right now that's an upright one and it tastes good. I, it's an arrowhead shaped leaf though and I prefer the nice smooth round spoon shaped leaf. Um, oh well. And there's an asterisk next to Ruby Streaks down here because uh, it's, it's really frilly. It was what we used. It survives well, but it, the, the frilly nature of its leaf is kind of, many people don't like the feel of it in their mouth. And Amara and Rosie are double asterisk because uh, I have found that they have not survived well in my low tunnels. So I would not use those in, if you were going for low tunnels. So, oh, and here's, <laughs> blown up. Sorry, I should have switched to this earlier. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep moving. And uh, we can, I can share this with anybody who's interested. So planting at the right time, I mentioned, that plant fully grown by early November is, is the best. Growth will start to slow down in October, but um, I found that this year when it was really warm and sunny in October, things grew very fast. And so I wish that I had planted later, but you can't, you gotta plant by averages. And this year was uh, one that things just grew faster. So I gave a lot of greens away to my neighbors. Um, yeah. Here's some dates for specific crops. All of these dates are gonna allow for a mature crop in the fall. If you plant later, like I mentioned with that chart earlier, it just, you might end up not getting any a, a good harvest until the spring, if you get one at all. 
The reason that the student organic farms mantra includes multiple harvests is because of the economics of it. If you have this thing taking up valuable real estate in a high tunnel, you want to be able to harvest it several times so that you can recoup your investment in that time that you've spent tending this crop. So salad, herbs, spinach, we would we would not cut them below the growing point. We would just cut the outside leaves, let the new leaves grow up, harvest it again. We would try to shoot for three to five harvests off these things. Kale, komatsuna, chard, same thing, stripping outside leaves. And then lastly, properly protected. This is a picture of a, uh, an internal cover inside of a high tunnel. Each layer is like transporting that plant to one growing zone further south but maybe better than that because you're cutting the wind, the drying effects of the wind in the winter off these crops. And that is one of the big reasons why the plants look so much better inside these tunnels than they would if they were just exposed to the elements. And you'll notice that I have plastic, a plastic sheet on here. Um, this is, uh, it's an old greenhouse plastic sheet. So it was, it was extra that we had laying around, but that heats up very fast in a high tunnel. So if you are doing this in a high tunnel, using a big sheet of row cover on here is actually a better way to go about it. All right, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> I have a section here talking about field production, and I I felt like I feel like it's kind of applicable because this is a garden that we are that. For the low tunnels, we are build, you're prepping the field and then putting low tunnels up of, over it. So bear with me here. Um, the spring field time, field prep time is often wet. And to get around that, fall prep is what I advocate for as much as possible. If you can do fall field prep um, and then have that bed ready for you, I'll show you what, what we do here. Uh, and what a lot of growers are starting to do. So the, additionally, another, another problem with the field being wet in the spring is that you can't, the, when, the, when, you, when you plant a crop, the weeds grow super fast right around it. And your time to weed those things, to cultivate, to hoe, is, are super short. So um, something to remember, if you're, a, if you're a diehard rototill for weed control, um, the, that's sometimes easy, but know that you are always bringing up new weeds if you're going, if you're mixing up the soil below that top inch. If you can till once and then just work the top inch, you will have less weeds overall. And when the field is wet, that's, you can accomplish weed control at that top inch before you can get in there and rototill for weed control. And one way people do this is by flame weeding. Uh, here's a picture of, uh, of somebody with a handheld Flame weeder, flame weeder torch. This works best on broadleaf weeds. Uh, it's less effective when it's humid or dewy. And a bummer, this is a picture from my, the farm that I started uh, here in uh, the Des Moines metro area. But you can see these little uh, Venus mallows that are, that are just coming up right in this part here. Those are, at this time of year, the cold, early weeds, the first ones to come up, they aren't very high up off the ground. And I found that they weren't killed by flame weeding as easily when they were not very elongated, when they were right along the, the, the soil surface, they were insulated. So it's not as, doesn't work as well if the, if the plant is, is really prostrate. These cool, cool season weeds can be a problem uh, when you're growing in the winter. These things, you're, you're, creating conditions that make these, these weeds grow really well as well. Chickweed, shepherd's burst, henbit, dandelion is a big weed uh, in, these, in, in these tunnels. So to control these things, you've got several options. You can use a silage tarp or landscape fabric. You can mulch, you can till, you can cultivate. What I and, and many small scale growers are, are now doing is silage tarping. So I prep the beds in the fall and then I cover with a silage tarp, thick plastic. Some people use old reused billboard 
uh, tarps. And this accomplishes weed control. It keeps it by covering them, not giving them any light. It kills off any weeds that are uh, overwintering there. It also locks in the moisture that was there before and doesn't let new moisture in. So when you peel it off in the spring, this is the same, this left and right picture are the same spot. I've just uncovered this. It, the, the beds are waiting there, ready to plant. So as soon as you're ready to plant, you pull the tarp off and you plant right into it. And the tarp does work to warm the soil as well. You can, in a, instead of silage tarps, you can use a ground cover or landscape fabric. Those things are uh, sold with several different names, but I would caution you to get one that is UV stabilized because um, many that are on the market and sold as landscape fabric are meant to go on a uh, in a landscaped area and then covered with rocks or wood chips or some other mulch and not ever see the light of day. And so if you just have it out, it will break down within months um, and start and then you'll have just just particles of plastic all over your uh, your yard and it's a pain in the neck. So this is a, a, a ground cloth um, that's used at um, you know nurseries. They'll put out pots on this. Um, this one in particular is a product called Sunbelt from DeWitt. Um, there are other ones out there. And I got this also from Nolts Produce Supply, but you can order this online from several retailers as well. I think more and more of the big box stores are getting this as well, but it's not landscape fabric. Just know that. Uh, uh, the, the, the bummer about this, it's a woven material, maybe a bummer, maybe not, is that it lets the water through. And so after a dry summer and fall, like we just came out of, I actually think that this one might be better because I want to get some of this winter moisture into that soil. Um, but if it had been wet, then this one would, would not uh, allow you to, to um, plant into it right away as you are, um, as, when the spring happens. But one thing I like to do is when I am planting, let's say I'm gonna be planting into this bed. Uh, oops, I'm gonna go back, sorry about that. I was trying to <laughs> indicate if I'm planting just a portion of this bed. Let's say I'm planting cucumbers in this bed. And I, because uh, I plant six successions of cucumbers into about a half of a bed. I'll just fold back, you know, this much over to here, expose this much soil, plant my first succession of cucumbers. And then when I plant my next one in a couple of weeks, I fold it back a little bit more, leaving all the rest of it covered so that as the uh, year goes on, I've got a fresh weed-free ground um, to plant into uh, every time I fold it back. And I don't have to worry about those weeds getting ahead of my crop because that's the that's the big problem. So those are cool. That's cool season weed control. Let's talk a little bit about cool season pests now. And uh, this, uh, this uh, I'm realizing this is kind of hard to read, but just know that I've got uh, two columns here: the pests on the left. The the control method is directly across from it on the right. So for slugs. Um, they love to get into those greens and um, it's nice and moist in those tunnels and they can go, uh, they can go pretty rampant. So um, there's a product called Sluggo. Uh, it's a granular, granular iron phosphate um, thing that, that you sprinkle down. I sprinkle it right at planting so that um, it's, it's on the soil surface before the plants canopy over. And it does a fair job. It's a bait and, 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 and pesticide for those, for slugs. Rabbits um, are a uh, are something that I deal with a lot here in Des Moines, and I've found that 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 white frost fabric, the row cover, is pretty good at excluding them. So when I plant most of my crops, I put that row cover right down, and and that keeps them out. Deer, I thankfully don't have to deal with them, but I'm sure many of you are just shaking your fist at me right now because that is your main pest. Um, in the, and they will stomp right through that white frost fabric. It does not stop them at all. So the, uh, I'm, I'm hypothesizing here that if you were to have a low tunnel and keep it closed at night, that that would be your, um, if that's when they're there, that would be the, the, the good way to keep them out. I know they didn't get into our high tunnels. Cabbage worms are, uh, are, are able to survive longer um, in these tunnels on the brassica plants. So uh, having BT handy to treat them is a, is a good thing to have. It's what has been reliable for me. And voles, this is their, their 
heyday right now, um, trapping voles is, is really the, the, the best way to go about that. Um, let's see here. I'm going to skip through a few here. Oh, garlic. So this is not one that um, maybe, Maybe some of you plant this, maybe not, but in case you don't and you're interested in it, this is one that, you, that, that grows or that I plant in the fall also and let it grow up in, all through the, or let it sink its roots down in the winter and then start to grow in the spring. This warm fall, mine is already this high up out of the straw, um, but it's it's like a dandelion. You know, the tip is, it, it get, if it can get nipped, it, it can get nipped back and then new shoot can come out. Um, there's a woman who uh, works for Extension in New York, Crystal Stewart Cortens. She, rather than like I do plant, who I plant in late October, early November, she plants in September because late October, early November, often wet, hard to prepare a bed. She has been doing uh, trials on planting earlier and earlier so that she can avoid that wet weather and she's found no yield loss yet at this point. Um, many people will plant this and mulch it with straw. That's something I do. Many people will plant it into black plastic mulch. Um, some people don't mulch it at all. Um, I know so, uh, a big garlic grower uh, at Great A Gardens, who they're now out in Earlham, and they they planted it in the fall. They mulched it with straw, and then that big derecho happened last December and blew all their straw right off of it. And they did have some loss from that, um, but but um, it didn't affect it super bad. But I think mulching is is good for the garlic. And then in the summer harvest, hanging it in a cool, dry place with fans on it. I hang it in the in the floor joists in my basement uh, and, um, and have the box fan on it. If you're growing winter squash for storage, harvest it before frost. It needs a warm, warm, dry location. This was in a greenhouse, one to two weeks. The only one that really shouldn't be cured is, is an acorn squash. It can take a light frost, but it's best not to. This is a pumpkin that got left out too long and it did come back, but it would it would be better without that. And uh, some other things to consider, maybe flint corn or popcorn. Storage kohlrabi is this one on the left. They can get quite big, but um, they store very, very well. If you've got an extra fridge kicking around somewhere, you want to store some of these things, they, they do really well in a low, th you know, low 30s, high, low to high 30s uh, thing. Parsnips, you can leave these in the ground as well. They, they will also get sweeter. Um, the one on, on the left is a, you can see down here. I, I oops, sorry, back, back. Um, this, I like to get the longest thread of a root as from, for these parsnips. This is when I did it back in 2016. This one here is 2012. It's, I, I, you know, <laughs> it's just something I enjoy doing, um, but you can see they get bigger over the winter um, if you harvest them later. But um, that is my time. 